So, hi everybody, thank you for coming. And uh, my name is Michal Hrušecký, I'm from a company called CZNIC and more specifically from the Tourist Project. And I'm going to speak here about a new router that we created. And we created a modular router and uh, we decided that we want to boot it and boot it over the network and I'm going to talk about challenges that we were facing and how we went around to make it actually happen. So, a uh, few words about who we are. Uh, CZNIC is a Czech uh, top-level domain uh, uh, registry. Uh, legally, we are some association of companies, but uh, in fact, we are working like a non-profit. And apart from uh, managing uh, Check top level domain. Uh, we do quite some open source development. Uh, you might know us for doing not uh, DNS alternative server or DNS resolver, for doing BERT, BGP routing daemon. And uh, we also do some uh, general good, mainly targeting uh, Czech Republic, like uh, yeah, education about internet and security and stuff like that. And one of the things that we do is also running Czech uh, national c -Cert team. That's actually how this project started. Uh, we didn't just decide that we are going to do routers. Uh, the original idea was to figure out uh, what uh, what uh, are the type of attacks on the ordinary users at home. So basically we wanted to know who's attacking them, how often, and what, what are the attackers trying to do. So to do that, we created the first router because we needed some device to run it on. And the routers at that time were unable to basically do what we needed to do. And we gave it away for free and run our security research on top of it. And when we started talking about that uh, on various conferences, when we were presenting the results of the research, we found out that people like the open hardware and open software and having a root account on their device and being able to trust their devices and stuff like that. So we created a commercially available option, which was Tris Omnia. Uh, we ran some Indigo campaign, we got the money, we made the router, and it's uh, now selling in retail, and it's uh, selling. <laughs> and it's, uh, again, open source out of the box, with the root account and everything. And uh, when we did that, we got some feedback from our users that they don't need SFP that we, put th that we had there that uh, they don't need Ethernet ports because they have just Wi-Fi. Then they need uh, more Ethernet ports and they don't need Wi-Fi. And they need more USB trees and stuff like that. So many conflicting uh, requests. And that's how Mox came to being uh, trying to make everybody happy. Uh, we created a uh, the modular router. And uh, to show you how it works, we actually created uh, some configuration web page where you get the CPU and then you decide what else you need, whether you need uh, some Ethernet ports. You just put some Ethernet ports. You need more. Let's put some more. Let's put some SFP in. and. Uh, yeah, that's all nice, and you can do it even with uh, the stuff that you buy in uh, retail. And the generic idea is that uh, if you need something special, and if you have well-defined uh, parameters that you want to achieve, you will just figure out the combination of components that will allow you to do so, and you buy it, and you assemble it at home, and you have a custom device as an end customer. Yeah, the idea is uh, great, but uh, there are a few challenges. 
like uh, what are actual components in there? From software side, we need to know what, what's in. And we also need to create some default configuration. So which port is actually uh, going to your ISP? Uh, you might have SFP, but uh, you might not have it. Uh, you can have uh, up to 25 uh, Ethernet ports, so which one would you pick as a one? And on the other hand, you might have just one Ethernet port, so is it one, is it one? And uh, what should we do when somebody buys a new module, have uh, he already had a router running, and now he extended it and added more ports or took away some ports? How to handle that? And uh, one of the things that we really wanted to do with this was also to allow people to basically extend their Wi-Fi coverage if they have some big house. So we wanted to create some uh, setup where you can use the MOX as a simple AP and take configuration from uh, your old Omnia and just e get extended uh, Wi-Fi coverage. That sounded like interesting and useful use case, but uh, it poses another set of challenges. So, uh, how booting works in general? When uh, the CPU starts, uh, it uh, runs a uh, U-boot that is stored in NOR, and the U-boot uh, initializes some hardware. U-boot uh, executes a uh, distribute, which is a spe uh, special command that is uh, nowadays pretty much uh, standardized across everybody. Well, everybody likes to use it. It's called distribute because distributions uh, agrees that uh, it's useful command. What it does is basically it tries uh, several different ways how to boot your hardware. Uh, it tries EFI, it tries uh, some configuration files, it tries a U-boot include file, and if everything fails, it tries to boot over network using PXE. And then the U-boot loads the kernel, device tree. Device tree is uh, something that is quite common in those embedded devices. It basically describes the hardware that you have on, on the device. Because, uh, yeah, you have a kernel, you have uh, virus drivers, but then you need something to tell you how, how all the stuff is connected together and where it is and if it is there. And then uh, U-boot continues with running the kernel and uh, passes through some command line, interim disk, this device tree, and stuff like that. That's the generic embedded uh, booting. Uh, we uh, we use this way, but we do some uh, some specific stuff because uh, our modularity. Uh, we have uh, some SPI bus on which we can uh, enumerate uh, all the available modules. So in the U-boot, uh, we use this SPI bus to figure out what modules are there and uh, how they are connected. Uh, to pass this information on. Then uh, one thing that we did uh, uh, after discussions with some distributions was that uh, we actually put uh, our device tree in uh, NOR memory that we have on the device itself as well. Why did we do that? Well, uh, kernel has plenty of drivers. And uh, usually, some uh, CPUs are supported pretty, pretty fast. But uh, so it's possible that you actually have uh, support for some of the devices that we have in MOX, even in your distribution kernel. But uh, what you are missing, uh, and why you wouldn't be able to boot it actually, is the device tree. So we took our device tree and put it into NOR 
So if your distribution has all the necessary drivers and doesn't have a device tree, uh, it will use the device tree that is available in NOR. And uh, what we did regarding the modularity, uh, yeah, the device tree describes uh, how all the hardware is connected, but uh, we would need uh, quite some variations of device trees because there is plenty of options how to actually connect the stuff together. If I take a look at the configurator, you see in just one way, but uh, yeah, something like this is possible as well. So there's a lot of ways uh, how to actually connect stuff together. Uh, our uh, kernel guy came up with, uh, with uh, the solution that uh, basically we have a device tree that contains all possible, uh, it contains uh, all the devices that could be uh, connected and it uh, connects them. And then uh, when uh, U-Boot actually runs the kernel, just before it uh, runs the kernel, he modifies the device tree based on the actual available devices and just disables the parts that are not there. And it actually works. And uh, since uh, we were dis deciding how to actually boot our system, uh, usual way some years ago was that uh, you created uh, your own boot command and you specified uh, where is your kernel, how is it named, and where is various stuff on your uh, device. But since distributions came up with uh, this distribute command, we decided that we are going to use it. And it's actually the default command that is run by Mox. And uh, we are using uh, uh, this uh, simple U-boot script that is actually booting uh, our mocks and uh, we have it saved in the root of partition which is one of the options that distribute tries. So if you have our system then uh, it will boot through normal distribute. If you have something else which we according to our documentation we forbid that because if you run some other distribution we cannot guarantee that it is within the specification and certifications and stuff like that. But uh, if you accidentally decide to go against our documentation, then uh, we have a distribute command, so it should boot any normal distribution, and we have DTB in NOR, so it should work pretty nicely. So that's how we get to the kernel and uh, to start uh, some system. Then uh, during the first boot of our distribution, which is uh, open reality based, uh, we do uh, some first setup and uh, we detect what modules are there. And based on that, we decide what is actually the one and LAN, one of the problems that I spoke about in the beginning. We decided that if there is uh, SFP, then it's one. Uh, if there are some switches, there are local network. And the tricky part is uh, the CPU port. The, the port that uh, you have on the CPU module. Uh, it can be your connection to, to the internet if you don't have uh, uh, SFP and if you have some other local network port, but also it can be a uh, connection to your local network uh, if you don't have any other port that you would use for that, and uh, or if there is uh, some other one port like SFP. So that's the first setup. Uh, in the following boots, we check on the boot uh, whether user modified the configuration 
And if we add, if we edit uh, some uh, new switches, we put them into a local network. But uh, apart from that, uh, we do almost uh, no changes, and we, yeah, we just remove switches that are no longer there. Uh, we don't touch the rest because it uh, might either confuse the user, or it might even uh, put him in s at some security risk. If you imagine that a uh, user just buys a new SFP and plug is plugs it in, and if we would uh, just change the one port, then maybe he didn't put the ISP cable into uh, the cable from ISP into SFP yet, so we would just uh, bridge it with uh, the local network. That's something that we don't want to do. And uh, hopefully he still has some LAN ports, and uh, hopefully we he can reconfigure which port is uh, internet connection and which port is local network. We have a web, web user interface that uh, allows you to do that. And if the user is completely lost, he can always do a factory reset and uh, go through the first configuration, which automatically detects what should be where. So that's uh, for the easy part when we have uh, just a router and want to decide what to do with it and want to decide what is uh, on the local network and what is internet and what should we trust and what should we not. Uh, now, the uh, little bit more interesting part, although I think that uh, the trick that uh, our colleague did in U-Boot is pretty interesting and pretty nice. Uh, he actually had a talk about that on FOSDEM, so there is a recording of uh, if you are interested in more details of that part. <coughs> network boot. Uh, why we decided to do network boot? Uh, we wanted to have some uh, centrally managed uh, APs, so you would have uh, your central central router, and you would configure something on it and then you will have some slave devices that you will just toss around and they will automatically do everything. And uh, it's, uh, in general, central management of uh, configuration. There are big projects that do that. It could be hard to set up. And uh, we just wanted to yeah, cheat a little bit and took the easy way out. And the easiest way to do the central management is if you have a well-defined version of OS that is running all, all those devices. And uh, if you are in control of what is installed there, and if you can easily deploy configuration there. So we decided that network boot will actually help us quite a lot, because there is uh, no local information stored on those devices that are booting over the network. Everything is always taken from the central router and it can just be nice and easy and always uh, consistent. So, how, how did we do it? Uh, as you remember, when I was uh, talking about uh, distribute command, I said that it's trying to do various, uh, it tries various ways to get to the kernel and to figure out what to boot actually. Well, if uh, everything fails, the last step is uh, pixie boot, and that's uh, what we actually use. Uh, on Omnia, we download the specially prepared netboot root FS. A uh, little bit about our distribution. We have, uh, we have packages, as uh, most of the distributions, but we also have a uh, few tarballs containing root file systems that, uh, that are actually built out of those packages. And one of them is uh, rootfs for the netboot. It's just uh, ordinary rootfs. Uh, 
with preselected list of packages. Uh, no special configuration, nothing. Uh, what we do is we take out from that root FS uh, kernel and uh, DTB and uh, so device tree and uh, one special thing that is in interim disk. We have a it's also again in one package, but we have a special interim disk f uh, directly tailored for this uh, netbooting functionality. It contains script that does a uh, few things and contains uh, some basic drivers, basic kernel modules that we need. And we create a fit image out of everything. A fit image is a nice uh, thing that uh, Ubud supports. You basically take your kernel, interim disk, and device tree. You can take uh, multiple of, of each and you put it into one file that uh, U-Boot can directly boot. It can contain uh, checksums of all those parts. It can, uh, those all those parts can could be signed, and uh, it can be, all those parts could be also compressed. So, uh, we take out the kernel and initram disk and device tree and create one file that contains everything. Uh, to make to be uh, to make it easy uh, to have just one file that we need to transfer over the network, uh, we could do it with a kernel that has embedded in interim disk. But the tricky part is that we want to use uh, packages and uh, standard root FS, and we need uh, the kernel compiled in the same way with same uh, with same options as uh, in the normal distributions. We don't want to maintain various uh, kernel images. So that's why we are taking it from root FS and doing fit image. And then we prepare everything on Omnia for uh, booting over Pixie. So we prepared the FTP server there. And uh, we let uh, Mox boot. Uh, one thing that we need to car take care of is to make sure that there is uh, some security involved at some point. Um, because uh, Mox uh, will need uh, access to some sensitive information like your keys for your Wi-Fi and stuff like that, and potentially more. Uh, you don't want to display this information to everybody who is on your network. So, what does this uh, interim disk that we created especially for the netboot does? Uh, when it starts, uh, it will generate SSH keys on MOX. And then it will connect uh, to Omnia and send over the public part of the key uh, with uh, its own serial number. And uh, on Omnia, it will pop up in web user interface, or you can list it on command line, and you, s you will see that there is a request from, uh, from uh, some device to be trusted, and that you can decide whether you trust it or not. The serial number is there to help you decide if you have uh, multiple MOXs, which one is it? And if it is uh, the new device that you just bought. Uh, when you approve it, uh, as part of the approval pr process, uh, Omnia will generate some random key for you as well for the MOX. And uh, MOX will download it now that uh, it's trusted, it uh, can use much more commands over uh, from the Omnia. And uh, once it gets the IS key, it will save both uh, the private SSH key and the IS key we will see 
why uh, why we have the IS key later uh, to U-boot environment, and it will also override the U-boot environment in such a way that uh, on the next boot, uh, Mox will no longer try uh, generic distro boot, but it will go directly for uh, Pixie and uh, will well not generic Pixie. It will go directly to TFTP boot, uh, download uh, kernel image uh, tailored specifically for this device and try to boot that. And once it sets up uh, the U-boot, it will continue with uh, normal booting, get uh, rootfs, unpack it, and start. On following boots, uh, when we start it, the mox will contact the DHCP server and ask only for one file that uh, has embedded its serial number into its name. And that file is actually encrypted uh, using the key that, uh, it, that got uh, exchanged during the handshake. And uh, mox will download it decrypt it because it has a key saved in U-boot environment. And if it works, then it will boot this image. And again, use SSH uh, to get rootfs, unpack it into RAM, boot it, and uh, we have it running. Uh, it will also use SSH uh, to get some initial Wi-Fi configuration, uh, some SSL certificates that are used later on for um, the central management or remote management, uh, and uh, sets up the remote access, actually. And it periodically also checks uh, whether there is some reason to start over. For example, if uh, the Omnia gets uh, downloads uh, new root FS with some updates, with some security fixes, or if uh, the configuration of uh, network boot changes, or if uh, if it seems that uh, the network is down and not working anymore, it will just reboot itself because that's the easiest way to recover. Uh, and when it reboots, it will re-download all the configuration. For example, what can happen is that uh, you decide to change your uh, network IP addresses and you move to a whole different range. And if you do that, then Mox wouldn't be able to communicate with, uh, with uh, the controlling router. So it will decide to just panic, reboot itself, and on the next boot from the HCP, it will get a IP address from the new range and a new updated configuration, and everything will work again. So uh, we are using SSH a lot there. Uh, when we were designing it, uh, we were thinking about uh, what to use as a protocol, but uh, we decided to go with SSH because uh, for the initial setup because it's really easy to abuse it um, and it's also quite standard and uh, well trusted and proven so uh, what we are doing is uh, when the mox is booting first time for the handshake uh, we pass on uh, some uh, private SSH key that is allowed to execute just one command on the Omnia and basically just send, I, I don't remember the exact limit, but uh, just a few bytes of the public key. And that's everything that is allowed with that uh, key that is uh, sent during the generic Pixie boot. Uh, to do that, uh, we are using uh, authorized keys, uh, uh, just a question to the audience, uh, 
who of you ever used authorized key for something else than just adding your key to have basically access to everything? <laughs> yeah, basically, uh, one of the features that uh, quite some people don't know about is that uh, authorized key is basically, uh, it's not just a list of keys that have uh, authorization to SSH but you can enforce some commands and you can uh, associate uh, commands with the keys and uh, you can also add some additional options to every key that is uh, logging in to your SSH server. Yeah. And that's, uh, that's what we are actually using there. Uh, I think it's uh, heavily used by Gitolite uh, to implement uh, Git server. So we, uh, the key that we are distributing uh, to every mox that tries to boot over the network, uh, it's forced to use uh, just one command, and it has uh, only the ability to store limited amount of data and nothing else. Uh, once it's uh, authorized, we get uh, the public key that uh, Mox created, that Mox sent us, and we add it to authorized keys, and we allow it to use more commands, but still really restricted environment. It cannot do any commands it wants. It can just run a uh, few options of the script that we are forcing it to use. So it can just... Uh, get uh, its key, uh, it can get some configuration, get root FS, but it cannot access any random files on the on the router, it cannot get uh, some uh, network uh, uh, forwarding on and stuff like that. So that's a really cool part that we are abusing. If you don't didn't know about it uh, till now, I really uh, suggest you to take a look at that. Uh, just uh, take a look at the man page for authorized keys and uh, you will see that there is uh, plenty of uh, interesting features that you can abuse as well. So uh, now I spoke about some configuration we wrote some uh, simple script uh, that uh, deploys the configuration when the router finally boots. And this is the configuration that we have. Uh, that's the options that we are presenting to the advanced users. You can uh, define some Wi-Fi networks that have some SSID and some key. Uh, if you don't define or if you use these uh, magic keywords, it will uh, pick the first uh, network that you have configured in uh, your Omnia and use SSID and key from there. You can override configuration per uh, Wi-Fi card. This is actually vendor ID and product ID. <coughs> and uh, we have, uh, and you can override it also per uh, MOX. This is actually the serial number of the device. So you can decide that uh, this device will be broadcasting on specific channel. And uh, what we have there by default is uh, we have actually two options uh, in the device for Wi-Fi cards. One is uh, SDI one, a little bit slower. And we are using that one by default on 2.4. But uh, we have also the a uh, more powerful one that can do 5 GHz AC and quite fast. So we are using that one on 5 GHz. And by default we are using uh, automatic configuration, which is not the automatic configuration uh, if you set it up in Wi-Fi, but it's our. And it basically picks a random channel. No. Uh, finding a good channel is hard. <laughs> yeah, 
the question for the recording, uh, uh, how our out of feature works and whether it tries to be clever. And uh, yeah, the answer is no. We decided to go with the dumb solution for now because uh, getting the correct answer with channel to pick is hard because uh, yeah, some some APs might be down, some APs might be up. Uh, actually, if we if we do this uh, network configuration, if we will try to be clever, and we will start. Uh, we will change something in the configuration. All the MOXs that are connected to the central router will reboot. So the Wi-Fi's will be down. They will boot up. They will scan the environment and found the, found the best channel to use. And because all of them are booting up at the same time and using the same algorithm, they will pick the same channel, which is uh, not the solution that you want. So we decided to, by default, just uh, do it randomly, and hopefully it will work. And if you find out what's the what's the typical uh, usage of the of the channels in in which uh, places and which channel might be the most uh, the well suited one to use, then you can overwrite it manually and. Decide by yourself. Okay, uh, so uh, we also have some other options how to customize the network booting because, well, uh, we like to play with stuff. And when we were designing the script, the, there were some really low hanging fruit that uh, seemed really useful. So you can provide custom root FS, you can create some overlay that uh, with few files that will get uh, injected into rootfs before booting uh, that might be handy if uh, you don't want to have a uh, net booted uh, ap but uh, net booted network attached storage or something like that uh, we also as i said as i was speaking about the wi-fi setup it's done basically by one simple script and that script can be also customized. You can replace it uh, wholly, or you can just add a few bits that will do something after we create uh, the Wi-Fi configuration. So, some conclusion. Uh, uh, something to remember, SSH is really great, and with authorized keys, it can be abused to do a lot of stuff. And uh, if you don't want to design your own protocol and do everything from scratch, uh, and if you are using just shell script, you can design your protocols over SSH. And it's really simple, easy to do, and yeah, it should be secure. Uh, Another interesting uh, takeout from this presentation, hopefully, could be that uh, U-Boot is also quite great and flexible, and you can do plenty of crazy stuff with that. And uh, it's scriptable and fit image. If you haven't heard about it up till now, it's also something uh, nice and interesting to look at. So thank you for your attention. and. If you have some questions, let's get to them. Okay? Uh, we have actual point pointers to the actual documentation where I can read up of fit emissions and that stuff. Uh, pointers to actual documentation about fit image? I don't know. I hope it should be on U-Boot uh, documentation somewhere. And I don't have a network now. Uh, but yeah, if you if you take a look at uh, the U-Boot uh, source repository, there is a directory with uh, several text files, and there is some documentation about fit image, what it actually is. Or uh, other other option is uh, you can take a look at uh, our netboot scripts because yeah, we are doing open source routers, so you can take a look at uh, our scripts and see how we are using it. 
but basically you create something that looks like a device tree. It has similar syntax, and you put there the addresses where everything should be. You put there uh, if it is a kernel, interim disk, or DTB, and uh, then you call some uh, make image with this file, and it will pick everything, calculate checksums, and create a one binary file that you can use to boot. That's the simplest usage. Yeah, um, I was wondering about this part with the serial number, which doesn't seem very secure to me. So, for instance, a man in the middle attacker could yeah. intercept this request and just forward yeah. his serial number and, and get the traffic. Did you think about some way? Um, so, suppose the attacker, um, of course, cannot um, directly interact with the new router that you put on the network, but maybe has access to the network itself. Yeah. So did you think about... There, there's, the there's the weak spot. Yeah, we yeah. know about that. Uh, uh, we solved it by our documentation. And <laughs> uh, we explicitly state in our documentation that you should disconnect other devices when you are doing the pairing procedure. We were thinking about how to do it. Uh, yeah, there are always uh, two things. So you want to do it uh, secure and user-friendly. So we haven't found... Uh, way that would be user friendly but uh this uh, this uh, setup is secure if uh, you can trust your local network and basically make sure that during the pairing you will disconnect other devices or that some that uh, that uh, if you make sure that uh, nobody can intercept your communication during the handshake which can be done that basically you take the device that you are pairing, you will connect it directly to the device you are pairing it with. And after pairing, you will take it away and put it somewhere far away. Yeah, but I mean, you could also think about, I don't know, um, putting in some USB drive with a key to the device that you are pairing and taking it apart, uh, taking it out after you complete the pairing, right? Yeah, in theory. Yeah, maybe we will implement something like that in the future. Uh, what what we already have is uh, flashing uh, of the of the rotors by 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 themselves uh, via the USB drive, and yeah, saving some some stuff in U-boot environment shouldn't be that hard. Yeah, but uh, initializing uh, the pairing procedure would be a little bit harder than. Yeah, it would it would require some uh, skills on the user side. This setup, uh, we were trying to make it uh, as simple as possible for people to actually follow. Okay, some more questions. If not, then uh, thank you for your attention. If you have some more questions later on, we have a boot in Menza area, and we have uh, our devices there, so you can come and put them together and apart again and <laughs> play with our bricks. <laughs> so yeah, thank you again. <laughs> Bye.